Well, hey everybody, welcome back to what would be the fourth video in my quick little update series that I've been making. Now this video, like I mentioned on the Kit Plane Enthusiast Facebook page, I wanted to make this video probably two or three weeks ago now, but every time I come into the hangar to make the video, I start getting busy building something and then an entire day goes by and I didn't make the video, but I got a lot done on the airplane. And I'm okay with that because right now my main focus is to get this airplane done. We're just so close. So I believe on the third episode here, we left off with the interior and I was going to show you the rear seat that I had made and then talk about my parking brake and then some of the things firewall forward. So let's start off with the rear jump seat. Now, since we're talking about seats, some of you might know that we offer seats on the Kit Plane Enthusiast website. I've par partnered up with Mark Seaver from North American Aerospace and we have a manufacturer that makes us seats they're available in different patterns and different colors. These seats are not uh, from the Kit Plane Enthusiast website. I had these made long before we started offering seats, but I had them in there. I'm still using these ones instead of my own seats because I had a, a control stick boot made and it, it's the same material. Uh, and so I just haven't had a, another one made yet from the new manufacturer. So I'm just, I have these old seats in here, but I will say, uh, the, the seats that we make uh, are much more comfortable than these seats. I've sat in this airplane enough to know that there's almost zero lumbar support in these seats. And uh, the ones that we make, they have a, a plastic backing that goes inside that gives you much more lumbar support and they're much more comfortable. And those are available on kitplaneenthusiast.com. The best thing too is instead of waiting a year to get your seats, the quickest we've shipped out seats from order to shipping is one week. So there's no big long delay if you need seats. We can get them out to you fairly quickly. But looking at the back seat, when I bought this material to have these seats made, I ordered the material myself and I had it shipped to the seat maker. I got enough extra, let me zoom out a little bit, to have a third seat made in the back. Now this is just uh, the, the bottom and top are just on quarter inch plywood and then uh, you know foam and, and covered in the same pattern to match the front seats. I will say though one thing I have to do is actually secure this. You can see in the back here if I can pull this out. I might not even have to. It kind of stays put as it is but I have these uh, they kind of rotate. I need to tighten those up yet but I just made these little angle brackets that kind of hold the seat back. And what I'll probably do is maybe put a screw through here into the back. But the bottom one here, I kind of had a, a, what I thought was kind of a neat idea for this. I made it so that I can lift it up so it's mounted on a hinge and I can inspect in there or make adjustments or whatever I need to do. And I thought I had this brilliant idea of, I bought a sheet of magnet material. And if you can see, I cut it into about a half inch strip. And what I did was I just put the, the magnet on the top there and then I was going to put a magnet, it's a sticky back magnet material. I was going to put it on the seat and then that would hold it closed. Um, but what I realized is I don't even need to put a magnet on there. It stays closed as it is. I'm not exactly going to be flying inverted in this airplane. So it, it's, you know, kind of tight enough in there where I don't really need to worry about it coming up or opening. So I can leave it just like that. The other thing I realized too is, and I don't really think this matters, but this is a magnet. And I have the AHARS units for the Dynon right back there. And, you know, technically you don't really want a magnet around there. But from what I've noticed sitting in here playing around with the instruments enough is that that magnet has no effect on that at all. But uh, anyway, that's the rear seat. I like how it's hinged so I can get to it. And in this one here, you know, I don't even know if I need to secure it in here. Once it's in there, it just kind of stays put, <laughs> but that's it. And if you guys are interested, on kitplaneenthusiast.com, we also sell these rubber mats for the front and back. And if you actually want to have people in the back here, you can't really have them, I mean, you could, but it's not a good idea to have them standing on here because this is just really thin skin for the bottom of the airplane. We make a hard plastic that mounts all around here it just slips in, but it's supported on the edges, so it's a, it's much uh, makes the floor much stronger if uh, you want to actually 
have people in the back seat. I don't think I will ever have anybody fly in the back seat, uh, but I wanted a way to close up the big gaping hole back here. And I figured I'd just make a thin, small seat and I can just stack cargo and camping equipment on top of that seat. Now I wanna tell you my parking brake story because hopefully I can save somebody else the time and hassle and the money from destroying their parking brake like I did mine. Let me give you a quick overview of the brake system on here just so we're on the same page as we're talking about the brakes. These are the standard Matco brakes that come with the Zenith kit. Although I did upgrade the uh, very cheap plastic lines that they provide, and these are all uh, high quality stainless lines from Aircraft Specialty. And I'll talk about more about those in just a minute. But you can see the Super Duty has dual calipers here. And uh, what you do is you just pump the fluid in here and it goes through this little connecting tube over to this one. And then from there, the fluid just starts going up into your brake lines comes inside the airplane and if you have a parking brake installed it goes through the parking brake and through the lines and it fills up those reservoirs that you can see on top of the actuators for the brakes and uh, on the kit plane enthusiast website we do have these brake line kits again they're made from aircraft specialty and we sell them in two different versions if you have the single brakes like i do like just on the pilot side we have that kit available. And if you have dual brakes, like brakes over on the pilot side and you have passenger brakes, we have a kit for that also. The parking brake does not come with the Zenith kit. If you want to add a parking brake, you will have to buy the uh, actuator or the valve separately. But you can see it just has this little lever arm on it. It has a cable here and it comes up here to my parking brake. You just pull it for on, push it for off. And that just actuates that little arm for your parking brake. Oh, and while we're inside here, just ignore all these cables. This is my, this will be the cabin heat. And then this one here that's not connected up yet, this is the uh, carburetor heat. So those two I have to hook up yet. So filling the brakes on one of these Zenith kits is very simple. It should take about 10 minutes to do. You just put a little pump on the bottom with the caliper, you pump the fluid up. When you see it go into the caliper, or not the caliper, the, uh, the reservoir there on the, the actuator, it's full, you stop pumping, you go to the other side, you do the same thing and you're done. Now, when I did my brakes on my cruiser and then now for the Super Duty, I have my buddy Andy come up and help me. He's got a Mooney, he lives about, you know, it's a 15 minute flight to come up here to help. And the reason I have him come up here is because I don't have the little pump that connects to the caliper and he does. So he comes up and uh, helps me do it. But the thing about Andy is anytime he's out flying, he stops in here or, or if he just comes up from his airport, within about a minute of being here, he looks at his watch like, well, I got to go. My wife's waiting for me. I, I got to run. And then he, he leaves. <laughs> it's like you just pulled your airplane out of the hangar, flew all the way up here, and like in a minute of being here, you have to go. But he's, he's been like that forever. So he's kind of trained me. So when he comes up here, he's in a hurry. He's gonna stay here for a minute and he's gotta go. So when he came up to help me with the brakes, he wasn't in a hurry, but it's just after years of him coming up here and always being in a hurry to leave, I just felt like I was rushing and had to hurry up just so I wasn't holding him up from his day and, and he could get going. And that is what caused me to destroy my parking brake valve. So what we do, is Andy will be down on the, the pump at the caliper, pumping the fluid up. And what I do is I take this little white cap out of here and I shine a flashlight in there and I can see the fluid once it reaches here, you can see it start coming up into the reservoir. Once it gets to the top, I tell him to stop pumping and then I put the cap back in and it's done. We go to the other side and we're all done. But this time Andy was pumping and pumping and we just weren't seeing any fluid come into the reservoir. That means something was holding it up. Well, the only thing that could be holding it up is the parking brake. And I was thinking, there's no way I could have put this in backwards. So with this arm like this, the fluid should flow right through it, but it wasn't. So I was like, maybe somehow I screwed it up, which wouldn't be unusual. So what we did 
was we just moved it this way, which would be parking brake on, and the fluid went right through it. So that means somehow, with all my planning I did as I was building this, I had this arm in the wrong position. Now, to fix this, all I had to do was take this little screw out, rotate this 90 degrees, put it back on, put the screw in, and everything would have been perfect. But because I was kind of in a hurry and not really thinking right, I was just thinking that the arm was in the wrong position and I had to take the arm off, flip this thing up or not, well, I guess upside down, right? Flip it over and then put the arm back on the other side because that would make it, you know, opposite of what it was now. Um, and, you know, I should have taken my time and thought through this, but it just, that's the first thing that entered my mind and that's what I did. So not wanting to waste Andy's time, I hurried up, disconnected this. I disconnected the four brake lines here, took the two bolts out, took the parking brake out, went over to the workbench, took the arm off, and I started pushing this, there's a, uh, a cam that goes through there. I started pushing it out because I don't know why, but I just thought I had to, to flip this over and put it in the other direction, which was just really dumb. But pushing that out really destroyed everything internal there, just the O-rings, because there's four O-rings on that cam. And there's, there's kind of like little pistons here that go up against that cam. And just pushing that out, it just destroyed all the O-rings. But I didn't realize that I did that at the time. But we actually, we, we did what we needed to do. We put it back together and then we put it back in and then everything worked great. The fluid went right through there. It went up there to the reservoirs. We filled them up and we were all done. And as a thank you to Andy, we grilled out a nice steak dinner. And then after our steak dinner, we came back and all the fluid was pouring out of here. <laughs> so uh, that's when I realized I, I must have ruined the brake by pushing this the cam out. Okay, so obviously we were done for the day. There was nothing I could do. I had to get a new parking brake. So I went on the Aircraft Spruce website and I thought these brakes were like a hundred bucks. They're $250. And I swear, like when I bought this three or four years ago, it was a hundred bucks. Maybe it wasn't, but that's what I remember paying for it. But it doesn't matter, they're $250 now. So I also saw that they have a $25 rebuild kit. So I thought, well, that's perfect. I'll just, for 25 bucks, I'll just buy the rebuild kit. I'll rebuild this one, put it back in, we'll be good to go. So I got the $25 rebuild kit. I carefully took this one apart. I followed the instructions perfectly, rebuilt the parking brake valve. Everything seemed to work well. Put it back in, connected all the brake lines. And then the next day or whenever it was, Andy flew back out here. We filled the brakes up again. We thought it was all good. And once we got the fluid up, Andy said, go ahead and press on the pedal just to, you know, to make sure it's stiff and everything's working. And when I pressed on the pedal, you could kind of, it was soft and you could hear fluid like gurgling out of the parking brake valve. And sure, I looked down and it was leaking out of the valve. So for whatever reason, the rebuild kit didn't work. And instead of buying another rebuild kit and trying it again, I just decided to waste the 250 bucks and buy a second parking brake valve. So the one we have in there now is a brand new parking brake valve with the arm on it in the correct direction. And then uh, filled up the brakes again. And of course, everything works fine now. But uh, that is my parking brake story. Don't be stupid and just start taking things apart without first looking at the instructions. Now, I will tell you this as an airline pilot, when I was a captain at Spirit, there are some times when an airplane comes in late or you go from one airplane to another and it's already boarded up, they're ready to go, you just have to do all your pre-flight checks. And the first thing I would tell my first officers is do not rush. I don't care how late we are, not that I want there to go out late, but we're gonna take our time, we're gonna make sure we do all the pre-flight checks, all the checklists, we're gonna do everything at a normal pace so we don't miss anything and everything's done correctly. And that's what we would do. And now that I'm at Delta and I'm a first officer again, when we're late, same thing the captains tell me. They say, do not rush. Take your time, do what you need to do, follow the checklist. We'll get everything done and we'll get out when we get out. That's the safest possible way you can do things. And, you know, I didn't listen to my own advice here. Instead of, you know, thinking about things and how to, how to move that arm or fix it, I just started ripping things apart thinking, I was like, ah, oh, you could just put this cam in the other way, it'll be good to go. 
So, all right, anyway, that's enough of the brakes. Uh, they're all on there now, they work great. Uh, that part of the airplane is all done. Now, let me just quickly go over some of the things I did on the firewall forward. And none, none of this is major stuff, but just little things that, you know, needed done that I finally got done. First thing here, I grounded the engine. This is the ground from the engine back here to the main ground. And I just used the same four gauge cable that I have on everything else. Not a big deal, just something that's done. One of the other things I did was I replaced the cable that goes from the alternator back here to the shunt and then back into the system. Everything is four gauge wire. I'm not sure why, but for some reason, the, the cable that I had here was, uh, it was either eight or 10 gauge. It was a lot smaller than this. Um, I'm not sure why I used a smaller one. Maybe it was a temporary one or something. You know, again, I wired this years ago, but either way, I just put a, a bigger uh, proper cable on the alternator. Now, one of the other things we did, uh, I'm not sure if I did this when Andy was here, maybe before, but I put a gallon of fuel in each wing tank because I wanted to start the engine for the first time. And I think I explained this before, before I riveted on the glare shield and closed all this up, I just wanted to run the engine just to make sure everything was wired correctly. Um, but when I filled it up, yeah, Andy was here because he was the one that everything was good, but we noticed uh, Andy was on this side of the airplane and you noticed some fuel dripping down onto the floor. And we were trying to figure out where it came from or where it was coming from. And what I realized was uh, I reached in here to this fuel line. I can't even get my hand in there now. This fuel line right here was only finger tight. So when I uh, was hooking all these up, I tightened everything except this one. It was just finger tight. So, you know, tighten that up and then no fuel leaks anywhere. Okay, and just to kind of give you a little quicker update here of just some recent things I've done. You can see I have a carburetor on this engine and you know, if you get a fuel injected engine, the, the fuel injection unit only hangs down about this far. Mine hangs down this far because it's a carburetor. It just hangs down much lower. And I, you guys have seen this before. I had to cut a hole out of the bottom of the cowling and everything. But uh, because Zenith has never installed one of these on a Super Duty with a carb, the air box that they have that goes up to the air filter on the front of the airplane uh, just didn't work. So I had to fabricate my own um, and it was, really, uh, it was really harder to do than you'd think because you have to figure out exactly where that filter is at to batch the opening in the front of the cowl and then build an air box uh, to fit that. It also has to go around the muffler and this muffler does not yet have the little heat shield that goes on here for the carb heat and cabin heat. Um, so I, gave, I left a little space for that, but you can see I have the... Uh, that box here. And again, if you follow Kit Plane Enthusiast on Facebook, you've already seen this on the airplane, but I have it all painted nice. Um, but that's the air box. You know, this is what connects to the carb here. And then this goes up here and then the air filter gets mounted to the front. So I'm just waiting for that paint to feel fully cure and then I can put it on. I do have the new spinner already painted. This is the prop. All of this is ready to install. But I am working now on the finishing up the last details of the baffling. And they're pretty much done. In fact, I just painted all the forward half of the baffling today. I'm gonna, I have it painted from about here forward so that when you look in the opening of the cow, you don't just see bare aluminum. It looks nice and painted. So I'm getting those done. Once those are done and painted, I can build all this back up again. Uh, put all that stuff back on, put the spark plugs back together. So it's really just finishing up the firewall forward stuff. And if I can just give you a quick look in the paint booth here, that is part of the baffling there that I painted. And then uh, that's the uh, top of the cowl that's painted. Well, this fourth update video was certainly a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be, but I wanted to really tell you my break story so that you guys don't uh, make the same mistake and just kind of give you a quick look at what I'm working on uh, firewall forward. So guys, this airplane is so close to being done. I cannot wait to finish this thing up and get it flying. Thanks for watching and uh, come back in. We'll see you on the next video.